welcome everyone. We'll give you all a few moments as folks join us in the space and then we'll get started. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started as people continue to join us. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Love Lockdown, Dating, Sex, and Marriage in America's Prisons. You can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A feature, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address everyone's questions. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, click on the live transcript option at the bottom of your screen. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Elizabeth Greenwood is the author of Love Lockdown, Dating, Sex, and Marriage in America's Prisons, and Playing Dead, A Journey Through the World of Death Fraud. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Vice, O, The Oprah Magazine, Long Reads, GQ, and others. Greenwood will be in conversation with Rafia Zakaria, the author of The Upstairs Wife, an Intimate History of Pakistan, Veil, and Against White Feminism, Notes on Disruption. She is a columnist for Dawn and writes the alienated column at The Baffler. Tonight, they'll be discussing love lockdown. What is it like to fall in love with someone in prison? Over the course of five years, Elizabeth Greenwood followed the ups and downs of five couples who met during incarceration. In Love Lockdown, she pulls back the curtain on the lives of the husbands and wives supporting some of the 2.3 million people in prisons around the United States. In the vein of modern love, this book shines a light on how these relationships reflect the desire and delusion we all experience in our romantic pairings. Please join me in welcoming them both to PMP Live. Thank you, thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank you so much, um, Chelsea. Um, I'm Rafia Zakaria, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to be speaking today with Liz Greenwood, author of Love Lockdown. Um, I know that most of you are just kind of, you know, maybe popping in for the talk because uh, you've heard about the book or you're curious about the topic. Uh, but for me, this is a very special occasion because Liz is my dear friend. So, um, you know, being present here at the launch of her of her book is kind of like being at a graduation uh, for <laughs> one of your close friends. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I know we have a very, very interesting discussion ahead of us today. So um, that said, one of the things probably people don't know about Liz Greenwood is that she herself has um, a platonic prison boyfriend. And so <laughs> she has more experience in this topic than just researching it. Um, so with that, I'll hand it to Liz to tell us more about this very interesting tidbit and about the book in general. Great, thank you so much, Rafia, and thank you so much for doing this event with me. I can't imagine a better interlocutor. And before I start, you know, promoting my book, I want to promote Rafia's book <laughs> against white feminism out in but August. But this is the book it you is... guys are supposed to buy today. <laughs> I know, I know, but I can't help it. It's so good. It's just like a mutual Cavell love fest over here. So, thank you for that beautiful introduction, and everyone should check out against white feminism. Um, especially white feminists among us. Um, <laughs> anyway, so as Rafi has said, um, it is true. The way I got into this topic is because 
I um, have my own prison pen pal who I still talk to, like I'd say every other day, multiple times a week for sure, more than I talk to Rafia, definitely. <laughs> so um, that's how I came to this topic. So I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction of my book that um, explains how I found my way in here. <clears throat> Over the course of reporting my book, Playing Dead, about fake death and disappearance, I acquired my own guy on the inside, or prison stalker, to use his jokey nickname for himself. Sam Israel III is currently serving a 20-year sentence in Butner Federal Prison in North Carolina for mail fraud and investment advisor fraud to the tune of half a billion dollars. Sam famously faked his death by staging a suicidal plunge off the Bear Mountain Bridge in New York in June 2008, only to turn himself into the feds three weeks later. That's why I reached out to him. Most of our relationship has been epistolary, over the phone and through CoreLinks, one of the many third-party for-profit applications that connect those in the free world with those in prison. Sam and I have been exchanging messages nearly every day for more than seven years. Though interviewing him for the book wrapped in 2016, Sam is still one of the people with whom I correspond most frequently and consistently. We've never met in person. Typically, I don't offer up much information about myself to the people I interview because it's irrelevant, not to mention boring. But with an interview subject who's in prison, who's lost much connection to society, the rules seem a little different. It seems unkind not to open up a bit more. So with Sam, I did, and I soon came to know firsthand the laser-like attention that a man with a very long day and little to fill it with can lavish on a lady. He gets an allotted number of monthly phone minutes, and once he has spoken to his family and lawyers, he spends the remainder on his stocky. My phone once documented eight missed calls from the prison over the course of one evening. Corlink's emails max out at 13,000 characters, and Sam, if his energy is up to it, will send a half dozen a day. He remembers little details about me and asks perceptive questions about how I'm feeling, about what I'm thinking, about my friends and family. When he was in solitary, he sent me a 22-page double-sided handwritten letter with stories of his past life on Wall Street. He's offered life advice, which I have found thoughtful, even comforting. His vantage in the slammer and the time to reflect on his past give him a unique perspective on what really matters. He asks questions and listens with an unhurried patience that's rare in our busy digitized world. Throughout the half dozen years I've known Sam, he has gone from my subject to my stalker to my friend. His story is often featured on cable crime shows like American Greed and like Clockwork. Each time he gets a slice of the spotlight, he gets a new batch of mail from women intrigued. When he first told me this, I was fascinated and perplexed. This hits on just the kind of paradox that I adore. In my first book, I explored the idea of how one could die in this lifetime, yet never escape one's essential self. Here, I saw a similar impulse. Could you find love and vivacity in the ugliest of places? And what are the prisons we erect for ourselves? Wow, thank you so much, Liz. Um, I think that passage that you just read really kind of presents in, in a very short space. Um, the thoughtfulness and empathy that you bring to this task um, of narrating relationships which are based on this sort of central inequality, right? Mm -hmm. One person is quite literally, in a physical sense, free, and the other person is restrained. And um, I've been thinking uh, a lot about your book and about the people in it um, over, you know, over the past actually several months, but in particular over the past few weeks because I've been thinking, um, you know, about how it relates to the lockdown now that we're mm -hmm. having some um, you know, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say distance because, you know, the pandemic is definitely ongoing, but um, 
But how did that, how did going through that experience, um, you know, what insight did that give you into a book that, you know, I know was written by the time the pandemic uh, began? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think that we all got a little tiny taste over the past 18 months of what, you know, millions of people in this country experience daily, which is just not being, is having your, um, really having to give up control about when and how you interact with the people you love. Um, you know, if you fall in love with someone in prison, the um, entire way your relationship is run is completely, um, you know, mitigated and, um, you know, totally challenged by the rules and regulations in place. So I think that we all got to feel that a little bit. You know, it's funny with the title Love Lockdown, like if you don't immediately think of the Kanye song, I think what a lot of people think about is being, you know, the kind of inverse of that, which is being locked down with, um, you know, our partners who we might want a little more distance from, <laughs> you know, under, under quarantine, um, which is precisely the opposite of what uh, so many people who love someone in prison experience, especially during during COVID, the um, in-person visits, conjugal visits, in the in the very few places they do still exist, uh, were completely, uh, you know, removed for the better part of a year, over a year in some places, um, and it's really sad because that's all in step with a move that's kind of a trend that's happening nationally in prisons, which is to do away with in-person visiting even in normal times and to go to this, what we're doing now, this kind of Zoom, Skype video visit. So there are many facilities in this country where you will drive to the prison and your loved one will be in a room and you'll be in another room, you know, 20, 30 feet away and you'll get on this video call and they've done away with that human connection, um, you know, due to budgetary reasons, security reasons, et cetera. Um, so that's very sad uh, for, you know, about a million reasons. Um, but yeah, it was it was yeah. really interesting to go through the pandemic and feel a little bit of that sense of um, alienation and lack of control. Uh, yeah, I was I was stopping you there for a second because you started to talk about conjugal visits, and I was going to bring it up later on. But since you are talking about them, um, like tell let's tell your readers about what a conjugal visit is and. Um, you know, and then we can kind of go into the specifics of the five couples that you profile in the book. Great. Yeah, it's the first thing everyone wants to know. It's the first question that most um, self-identified prison wives who I interviewed get asked when they find when other people find out that their husband is they say oh well, conjugal visits right <laughs> wrong usually um so conjugal visits is really a misnomer um they're really family visits uh, meaning that these are semi-private visits that happen on prison property usually in a trailer or kind of like apartment bungalow type thing um usually for about the length of a weekend and they are for immediate family so parents children brothers, sisters, spouses. These exist only in four states right now. Um, California, New York, Connecticut, and I forgot the fourth one. That's embarrassing. Um, I'll remember. <laughs> so only four states have them and not every facility in each state has them. Um, Washington State, that was the fourth. <laughs> um, so they're very rare. They're a real rarity. Um, and you know, you are enabled as a incarcerated person to get those based on having like a completely perfect disciplinary record. Um, and, you know, the people who are, you are, who are visiting with you being approved and going through very lengthy security, which takes hours usually to get into these visits. Um, but during the course of the visit, you're able to do some normal things that a person in prison rarely gets to do. Um, the outside person can bring in groceries, cook nice meals. Um, usually they have like a kind of um, TV setup where you can watch movies, play video games, go for walks, 
played board games, all those nice things. Um, every single piece of research uh, and studies supports that these are hugely important, you know, not just for the person who's incarcerated, but for the communities they're coming back to, because this gives them a little taste of freedom, a little taste of normalcy, and it's a chance to strengthen these family bonds that are broken by design by the prison system. And those family bonds are really a key piece to um, anti-recidivism. So, Conjugal visits are amazing. They're also very, very rare. <laughs> um, yeah, but the couple that one of the couples that you do profile in uh, your book, and I thought that this was, um, you know, I mean, they're all the profiles are extraordinary, but this one uh, was was really something I was not prepared for because it was a man who was writing to a woman who was in prison. Mm -hmm. So it's Evie and Jacques. Uh, Jacques and Evie. And so tell mm -hmm. us, yeah, tell us a little bit about Evie and Jacques. So this was such an interesting couple. So, you know, I chose the couples I profiled in this book because I really wanted to try to represent as wide a swath of experiences um, for couples who met while incarcerated as possible. So, you know, I think the kind of prototypical image we have of a, a met while incarcerated MWI couple is, you know, there is a kind of high profile, um, Per man in prison and he's on the news all the time and there's a woman at home writing him letters saying oh I think you're innocent blah blah and they meet and hit it off and you know I think that's kind of the the broad stereotype right and that exists like for sure that happens but you know and also I think we have this image that's often women because that's the fact of the demographics the prison population in the United States is 93 percent male so I also knew that, you know, the experience of female prisoners in this country is also really different. It's really distinct. So I wanted to make sure I had a couple um, where I could speak to what a female prisoner's experience is like. And also I think because a man writing a woman in prison is not the image we have in our mind. Right. It's also much more, you know, I don't know. It's really interesting. Like, what's that about? Who, who, who are you, sir? So that was um, the question I found. So EVA and Jacques, they're so interesting. Jacques is a former diplomat, um, worked mean, for the me, Canadian that government. Just not, that was just crazy. Right. Highly educated, worldly, you know, um, well off, travel, has traveled all over the world, um, speaks multiple languages. And he married um, Evie de Molina, who is serving two consecutive 25 to life sentences for her involvement in a homicide. Um, so this was a really interesting match to say the least. Um, so one of the things I wanted to see what was different between all, not only the experience of um, men who are in prison versus women, but also the experience of, you know, an outside partner who's a man versus a woman, because what I saw time and again um, for a lot of these prison wives, again, self-described their term, not mine, um, very big point of pride for them to be a prison wife, the great thing, um, was that there is a real pride in that identity. And what that comes down to is a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of holding down your man, loyalty, monogamy, you know, hard work, like hustle, all these things. So I wonder, would it be the same for a man? And Rafia brings up this um, point of conjugal visits because this was really different. You know, many of the uh, women I interviewed, some of them had husbands with life sentences without conjugal visits. And again, these couples met while incarcerated. They did not know each other before. So they will likely never have the chance to experience intimacy and privacy with their husband. Jacques was really different in what he told me and he described. He said, you know, I wrote to EVA and we had this um, correspondence and we met and we fell in love. But he was very upfront with the fact to me that he probably would not have married her if conjugal visits had not been on the table. She's in, imprisoned in New York State where they are possible. So that was one of the biggest distinctions that, you know, at least in this one, my very small sample size right. in Italy, um, you know, that 
a male partner would not take the same kind of pride in that sacrifice. I thought it was also really interesting that in that relationship versus the relationships with uh, prison wives, with, you know, incarcerated uh, partners, um, I was fascinated by the fact that he felt like he was being almost like benevolent toward her, where he was giving her something she would not otherwise have. Um, and he wasn't really particularly interested, it seemed, in discussing with you how he might have abridged his own life on the out, you know, obviously on the outside. Whereas like, you know, some of the women like Joe, for instance, um, uh, that you profiled, actually, I think all of the women that you profiled live, um, you know, celibate uh, mm -hmm. lives uh, because, because they take this relationship, this marriage, um, you know, seriously. But mm -hmm. he seemed kind of like, well, I'm such a great guy that I'm doing this for her. Whereas I felt like the prison wives were more like, well, I hope he's not writing to other women as well. Yes. He doesn't have a thing going. So talk a little bit about that, because I thought that was very, I don't want to say telling <laughs> about men, but but it was kind of interesting because it was such a yeah. markedly different outlook. Was I mean, and there is no denying that for any outside partner who is committed to someone in prison, um, there is a lot you do to make their lives good. And you know, Jacques was very upfront about that. He was like, This is what I'm doing is really good for her. And what that entailed was, you know, putting money on her commissary account, writing letters with her, visiting. Uh, with her having these conjugal visits, you know, once every few months, I believe it was like six weeks to a few months. Um, and that no doubt is great for a person who's inside. It softens the time a little bit, you know, that connection is, is hugely important to maintaining your humanity and same for the men um, who are there. But I, th I feel like what you're alluding to and what I noticed is that for women, it's just kind of like, yes, this is what we're signing up for. This is part of it. This is my role um, as his wife. And I think that, um, you know, much in the way, like when, you know, your husband does the dishes and he expects a brass band to march through the ki right. kitchen, you know, like it's a similar thing. It's this kind of similar thing. And we see that on the outside too. There's just a, a bit more, um, you know, fanfare for doing the, the kind of emotional labor of a relationship that women are just more conditioned to and, and expected to do, I think. Okay. Um, so another part a uh, favorite part of mine about this book uh, is the prison wedding that you attend and that you take us to right at the outset. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just like what it was like to attend this wedding, you know, how I guess you felt perhaps even as an investigative journalist um, in this kind of this this environment that's very literal in in the separation that it imposes. It was really amazing, and I'm so grateful <coughs> that I got to experience it firsthand. So, um, this was the wedding uh, between Journey and Benny Reed, who are really the main couple I follow mm -hmm. from the day of their wedding until um, his release from prison uh, in 2020. So. I had started interviewing uh, Jo, as she's known um, among friends, uh, just a few, like about a month or so prior. And I met her for the first time when we went to a mall in New Jersey to go shopping for outfits that would be uh, appropriate, you know, for um, not only the wedding, but for the visits she would do that week. Jo lived in Maryland at the time and her um, husband, Ben Benny, was in Oregon State Penitentiary, a maximum security facility um, just outside Eugene. So twice a year, this facility cancels regular visiting hours and it has weddings. And when you have a wedding in prison, um, this is something I did not know that was surprising. 
you have to go about securing your own um, officiant. The prison chaplains don't do it. They say it's like a conflict of interest or something. I don't know. They don't do it. So you have to find your own person to perform the ceremony. And, you know, even just with that, Joe told me that she would reach out to people she found online in the area and say prison wedding and they wouldn't return her emails they wouldn't return her calls. Um, so she did um, eventually find one fellow who um, he's an administrative judge who are in Oregon. Um, can do these weddings and he does them a bunch and he actually said that he really likes doing the prison wedding more than doing like the big pomp and circumstance country club weddings he told me wow. he said you know it's really about the couple when you do <laughs> a prison wedding there isn't you know there aren't there are other guests there usually um so he he really um, found them to be very special so the um, regular visiting hours are, are canceled and you have like a morning session for the weddings and then an afternoon session. So we had the morning. So we got there and you know, there in the, in the little lobby where you wait before you go in security, there's like half a dozen brides to be kind of milling around and everyone's nervous and you know, like it's their big day. Um, so it was really interesting. So then, you know, we went through security, which is always, um, you know, a heart racing moment going into a prison. I mean, and it's like, it's the panopticon, you know, it's surveillance. You feel like you're, you're, you're like, am I smuggling drugs in here? Like, I don't know. It's, it's a scary moment. So, um, we were not <laughs> for the, uh, the record state. Um, so, you know, you go into the visiting room, which they had decorated, I guess they just have some decorations, you know, on hand for this occasion where they'd set up kind of a chuppah and like a, an aisle with some paper. Um, and they have a photographer there who's another incarcerated person taking the pictures. Um, and everyone gets their little turn. And it takes about, you know, I think that Joe and, and Benny's ceremony was maybe like seven minutes. Like it was, it was quick, but they had both written their own vows um, and read them to each other. And, you know, the cool thing about at this particular facility on that day that made it very special that they both said was that because it is a maximum security facility, they are usually separated by a table and sit on opposite sides of the table um, during a visit. And on the wedding day after the ceremony, they got to sit next to each other. They never sat next to each other before. Wow. And that's what they were both like really looking forward to um, getting to, you know, snuggle a little bit. Um, so it was really interesting. You know, I, I say this in the book. I never forgot I was in a prison. Like I was very aware I was in a prison the whole time. But it did feel um, incredibly meaningful, special, you know, this wasn't a wedding where, you know, like the mother of the bride's milling around driving everyone crazy. Like this really was about the couple and about that moment. So it was very interesting. Wow. What, um, in your opinion, what sustains these relationships? I mean, is it, um, you know, cause one of the things that I was thinking while reading their stories was that are they sustained by the fact that they never actually see the reality of this person, right? Mm -hmm. You're never going to see the dirty socks and like the toothpaste and right. all the many things. So in some ways, you know, the person accords to, so like, you know, you have some pieces of reality about the person that you know, and then you have all this other stuff that you've imagined and filled in right. there and of course like you know what we <coughs> imagine is always better than than what we what reality is right um so tell me a little bit about that tension is how real are these relationships and do you think that that element of fantasy is involved in sustaining them it's such a good question. And it was a question that really propelled me through five years of reporting, you know, what makes this worth it? There's so much that I think um, an outsider would look at and say, why, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is like great inconvenience, great sacrifice in many, in many ways. Um, you know, I think for it, it really varies um, couple to couple. One thing I noticed in a couple that I write about, um, Sheila and Joe, I think a big thing that sustained them, um, 
you know, in addition to their great love and, and respect say a little and bit admiration about Sheila, for like, so Sure. Well, she was the one. Yeah. Who- Sheila was in management at the New York Times, but she's a former editor, former, uh, she was a uh, reporter in London and Nairobi and, you know, living in New York City. Um, and she was still employed at the New York Times and she um, was volunteering for her prison ministry and she was the person answering letters, various pen pals. And one came in from Joe Robinson, um, who was serving 25 years for murder um, that happened, you know, when he was, gosh, like in his early 20s, like young. And at this point, he was in his uh, 40s, 30s, 30s. He'd been in for 15 years at that point. Um, anyway, neither of them really looking for love and and they fell in love and they got married and there's they're still married today and um joe is off of um probation now for almost two years um completely out of the system completely done so they are the coolest um so one thing i noticed about their relationship their marriage um in addition to yes their great um respect and admiration for each other is that they really have a shared mission of of social justice. So that was one thing that brought them together. And that was something that they worked on various um, projects and books um, and nonprofits. They set up a nonprofit together when um, Joe was still in prison that they worked on. So I think having a shared mission that way for them was one thing that sustained them, where it felt like you know, you feel so powerless in the system, but working on these pro- really positive and right. impactful projects together gave them um, a, I think a feeling of agency and a feeling of, okay, we're going to make something from this, you right. know, from this experience. That's one thing. Um, I think that, you know, this is something that I, I saw uh, several times is pretty heartbreaking. I think that the, the, fantasy of homecoming is a big thing that sustains people, even through very lengthy sentences, you know, even through you're looking at five years, 10 years, you know, one day he will come home and things will be normal and we'll get to just do normal things together. When people come home, they come home with a lot of trauma. And that is something that people aren't always expecting and they don't always know how to navigate. So that can be a real, a real, like cold what water sorts in the of like what how does it manifest yeah well um there's a discrete form of ptsd called post-incarceration syndrome and that is seen mainly in people who have done longer sentences like 10 15 years plus but i don't know i would say again anecdotally very anecdotally that this it, it can be a far shorter sentence to experience this And the qualities of that are, you know, bringing in habits that were uh, very adaptive in prison and not being able to shake them outside. So for example, kind of wearing the mask, like a kind of stoicism you have to have in order to survive. Um, So, you know, like ignoring birthdays, holidays, not getting emotional around those sorts of things. And then you come home and it's your birthday and people want to celebrate you and they can't understand why you don't want to engage with that. Um, you know, Fernando Bermudez is a person I write, write about who was wrongfully convicted and served 18 years in prison for no reason whatsoever. Um, he would wash his underwear in the shower, which is what he did at, in prison all those years. And he did that for a long time when he came home. Um, you know, keeping to the schedules of prison, waking in the middle of the night, because sometimes they have to wake in the night for count or very early in the morning. So that's just when the day starts. Those are some very like prison specific types um, of post-incarceration syndrome trauma, but then general PTSD, you know, going into, it's so funny. I taught, well, it's not funny, but it's um, springs to mind. Um, one of the people I interviewed for this book, um, was released. Um, he had a life sentence for a nonviolent uh, drug offense, and he was actually released um, because of uh, a medical compassionate release. So wow. he'd been in prison since the early '90s, and he um, just came home a few months ago. And he said that he's been going through what what guys inside his facility called the Walmart test, which is can you just walk into Walmart and not completely lose it, <laughs> like not completely melt down, get overwhelmed. Um, so he said he's been working on his Walmart test quite oh a few times. Gosh. That's something that I, yeah. wow. 
like I mean it makes sense it makes mm -hmm. complete sense but the reason why I guess I'm surprised is because I would think like to me the idea of prison is very very overwhelming right like so yeah, right. all these like clanging doors and um mm -hmm. just like the the like you said the panopticon that whole mm -hmm. sort of sense of being surveilled constantly uh you know to me that would be what would be incredibly um you know overwhelming so to think that of course like it's it's the opposite for them where they're uh, it's it must be a different kind of way of ordering information you know in your yeah life. um you know one thing that has always stuck with me that someone told me was um after he got out of prison after being in for um, a number of years you know more than a dozen the feeling of riding in a car because for 12 years he had not gone any faster than his feet could take him just that experience that sensation it just felt completely overwhelming and scary because he'd only gone two miles an hour and now he's going 55 so i mean it's the things that we just take completely for granted um that are really you know that is can rock people at first um but also talk a little bit about like sorry i don't know what it's, okay. it's my Zoom life that's fine is a disaster obviously <laughs> um he's an er doctor during covid we give him a pass but see this <laughs> but but this is actually important because this is something that you said that the prison wives do all the time where it's like they are afraid to uh, put their phones on silent they're mm -hmm. kind of like their phone is like their handcuff you know mm -hmm. um and i thought that was really i mean it, it makes sense right like because they cannot call him um right you know so so it makes sense that they would feel that this i mean they have got to take the call like i remember like you were talking about um you know, you went and you were uh, staying with Jo, which is one of the mm -hmm. the wives, and um, she has <coughs> children. Her, you know, t her own twins. And at one point, you talked about how, you know, she's in a good mood because she's had a call, and mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that was so interesting because it provided so much insight into human moods and like mm -hmm. how even. I mean, this guy is in that, in Joe's case, he's across the country. You know, she talks about how he's the farthest away. I think that he could mm -hmm. be well being in the US from mm -hmm. her, um, you know, and she's living this completely sort of different life of a suburban mom really mm -hmm. with her kids. And, um, but at the same time, her heart and her emotional entanglement is with this guy who you know who even if he calls her for like his 15 minutes um that kind of transforms her day um so i'm curious liz like well a, a couple of questions one is that it, was there one story among the five that you felt was particularly relatable and mm. um you know particularly um made you feel kind of like you know like this could happen to me like this i could see myself in this in this place um so in that sense like was there one story that really kind of stood out to you. And I also wanted to know if there was any particular assumption that you had going in that you, um, you know, that, that you were just surprised to find, like find completely challenged by all of this information. Those are some rich questions. I could spend the rest of- I know, I know, <laughs> I know. I talking about this. Those are good. Um, so I think in terms of relatability, um, I think with Joe and Ben, you know, 
I don't, it's hard to say like for, for me personally, if like, this is, you know, what I would do. I don't, I don't think so. This is a conclusion I come to at the end of the book is that, you know, people put themselves in situations, even when they seem, you know, very bizarre on the outside, it's something about it works for them. Like there's something intrinsic about this setup that works where it's not, you know, it's not, um, a, it's a feature, not a bug. Right. Um, so that, that was one thing. And I think, um, with Joe, I saw that a little bit, but I found her relatable in the sense, just like the anecdote you're bringing up, you know, she had, she finally had her phone call. And when we see you asked that question about the power imbalance at the beginning, that was something I saw. Cause of course you think the person on the outside has all the power, right? They can decide if they're going to visit, if they're going to, send money, all those things. And that's all true. It's also true that they're the ones waiting by the phone. They're the ones that are, you know, have their kind of world and clock revolve around the schedule and availability of their loved one in prison. So they often do feel powerless. And they're, you know, I think that, you know, when you're talking about the correction system in the United States, like power isn't even a thing that comes into it, everyone feels utterly powerless. You know, it's it's a capricious system. Um, anyway, that's a sidebar. Um, but I think that, you know, she got her phone call and I think we've all felt that, you know, you get your texts from your boyfriend or your husband yeah. and you're like, oh, this is great. You know, in prison relationships, that text, that phone call becomes freighted with so much more meaning because for a lot of people, that is the crux of their relationship. That is how communication and interaction takes place. So it becomes really swollen with, with great meaning. Um, but, you know, when I I chose to write about Betty and Joe as kind of my principal couple because Joe specifically, um, when you dream of people to write about, like you dream of her. I mean, she speaks basically in quotations. Everything she says is just, you can't believe it. Like she's very funny and very, and very, very thoughtful and very reflective. There was nothing I could ask her that she had not thought about herself 15,000 different ways. So it never felt like I was revealing something to her about herself. Like she's so introspective and so, um, yeah, reflective. She thought about all this stuff, you know, she's like, I know this seems crazy. I know people don't, and I sometimes like, I feel she taken the, the book, you know, like just having her story, I know it's not only her story, but her story right. does loom large in the book. So how how has she sort of like, you know, I guess uh, maybe, you know, maybe these questions are really amateurish and it's because like I'm a columnist, oh, not no. an investigative reporter. But like, I'm just <laughs> curious as how, um, you know, for those people uh, who are listening who also don't know about investigative reporting, like, um, like how do you maintain your boundaries and also like how do you explain to a person who's never been written about um what it's going to feel like or be like to have you know like literally their story um in a book uh that anybody can it's buy. so hard it's so hard and it's it's like one of the hardest most fraught parts of this job like for sure with this book I was a little luckier because this is my second book so when I would approach people I'd say oh look here's my first book and these are people I wrote about and I had that experience I could say you know I'm going to ask to write about you and you're going to think that means we're going to talk on the phone for 15 minutes but I'm going to come stay at your house <laughs> I'm going to like you know drop off your kids at the bus stop with you and I'm going to be calling you know I was just talking to Joe you know, oh my gosh, like five and a half years later, I'm still asking her questions, you know? <laughs> so I try to be pretty upfront with that, about that with people, um, because it's a huge commitment. It is a huge leap of faith on their part, like to trust a total stranger. But also stranger. on your part. I mean, you know, you <sighs> are, I, I don't think people truly realize what it's like to produce a work of investigative reporting that is of this, this caliber. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that um, I, you know, I really love about your writing, which is that I know that it's nonfiction and the fact that it's nonfiction is 
what, you know, I mean, I'm a big reader of nonfiction, mm -hmm. so that's what appeals to me. But I wanted to read like a novel and it like or, you know, the story of five different couples. And it very, very much does. And well, so I don't know. I was wondering if nice. you want to talk a little bit about like how you do that, because I mean, I would imagine that so you know you go and you have a trip where you spend say a week with joe and you know mm -hmm. you go part of that might be going to a prison part of that might be being with her at home but then mm -hmm. you come back and you mm -hmm. like where do you start when you come back oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's intense it's intense i mean for me um I think, you know, this question you asked about boundaries is a really good one. That's something I'm still completely trying to figure out because when I'm with someone um, in an interview on a reporting trip, my purpose in that moment is to be completely present there with them. It's not to really be playing like devil's advocate or questioning their story. Of course, I'll ask follow-up questions. I try to understand. Um, that comes later. That comes in the writing. So in those moments, it's it it is yes and all the way. So that like it's a level of attention and presence that I I in my in my daily life don't really experience very often. So I would come home like very spent from these trips, very spent in my mm -hmm. process because I'm um, completely anal retentive is I record everything like that. I'm changing the batteries on that recorder like every day. And then, you know, once I come home after I've watched Bravo for like 12 hours and <laughs> eaten a lot of chips and stuff, I um, basically relive the trip like through these tapes. And of course, you know, I have all the cringy like, why didn't I ask that then? Oh. But then I have a bunch of follow-up questions to ask and I transcribe, um, I do all my own, uh, I do a lot of my own transcription. For this book, I had some I had some help, which is great for things that weren't like super key. Um, but it's like in transcribing those interviews where the writing starts to happen, where I can really hear the super charged moments in a way that I couldn't when I was taking in all the information and trying to understand. So it's a very, um, inefficient, inelegant, kind of ugly, <laughs> ugly process. Yeah. I, can't, I can't figure out how to do it another way though. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I am going to stop. I think it's, oh, it's past uh, a quarter till. Um, yeah, let's hear some I questions. Think, uh, Chelsea, if you wanted to come, there you are. Come back on and um, see if we have, I think we have a bunch of questions. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so thank you. I'll, I'll just read these out and um, we'll start with Lori Hackett, who says she works in the Department of Corrections in Maryland, both as a counselor and educator. Those imprisoned are people, she says, human beings, etc., except they are limited by movement and freedom. Have you thought about researching the effects of the children who are also impacted by their parents being incarcerated? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, I didn't because I really need, like this book was already so ponderous that I needed to really have a narrow um, purview, you know, so it's not only romantic couples, it's romantic couples who met while incarcerated. So not couples who knew each other before or anything like that. So that was always really my strike zone was to focus on that. There are some great books about families and children of the incarcerated. Um, one by Megan Comfort that I really encourage people to check out. Um, she's an academic and that's great, but there's been some great work done on that. And there needs to be more because there are so many, that is the experience of so many children in this country, just because of mass incarceration and because of the numbers we have. And, you know, I hope someone out there far smarter than me does a great book on that because it is, is a rich and important topic. And thank you so much for your work that you do in the Maryland DOC. It's awesome. Okay, let's see here. What, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. What was the most shocking thing you learned about these relationships? A, and B, what did you learn about yourself in the process? 
Ah, great questions. Um, so the most shocking thing, I mean, yeah, I just kind of goes back to something um, Rafia asked previously that you get a chance to answer. So this is really good. I think um, the shocking thing to me was, you know, I think I had this um, as open-minded as I tried to be, I still had this preconception about what even reporting this book would be. I kind of thought prison wives unto themselves were a discreet subculture, you know, that I could just kind of like enter in and burrow around and come out and write my book. Well, not the case. I mean, this is, you know, these are people as, as who are as, you know, diverse and, idiosyncratic and unique as anyone. So it was just shocking to me that every time I kind of thought I had this figured out, I would meet someone, I would meet a couple and it would get completely turned on its head. So for example, I thought that um, what I saw a lot, and I do think this is a thing, is that couples who meet while incarcerated for the outside partner, often they have not had a loved one in prison before. So they did not grow up with a parent who is incarcerated and know that story. So this world was completely novel to them. And something about that was exciting, interesting. Then I met Crystal and Fernando and she had a brother who was incarcerated. So it's just things like that. It was just the constant getting turned on its head all the time. Um, so that was really interesting to me. There is no you know, narrow definition. And then what I learned about myself, um, yeah, I mean, five years, a lot happened in my life over the course of those five years, <laughs> you know, a lot. Like I just, I had met my, my now husband. We just started dating when I started to work on this book. I had a baby. I'm going to have another one in a month. So, I mean, in a way, it was a, I mean, forget the pandemic and the Trump administration, like there was a lot going on, you know? Um, so I feel like, you know, I really liked reporting playing dead and writing playing dead, but I think that, you know, both because of who I am now going through this experience and the way the world has changed, like the, the voice of this book is very different from that. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but I think it was just the combination of, you know, being so enmeshed in these couples' lives and, you know, really bringing in and allowing myself to bring in like that pain. Um, it really, you know, matured me and enriched me as a person and, you know, completely opened my eyes to what is unfortunately an all too common experience in this country of, you know, the kind of um, uh, trauma that people, just families experience, um, even if they're not incarcerated themselves, just by having a loved one incarcerated. So it was pretty intense. All right, let's see here. What else do we have? So this one, I think you've, you've partly answered it. Um, and so you, maybe you just want to add something and then other, other part of it may not be quite um, a propos of your book was so, but here goes. There's a temptation to believe that a certain type of person is attracted to, to developing a relationship with an incarcerated person. I imagine that's not the case. This person says that you can't stereotype the person um, who accepts this kind of relationship. Can you talk about though the women who sought a relationship with the famous incarcerated male? Uh, so I do um, touch on that in the book because, of course, it's what we all think. And the person I write about in there um, had since retired from corresponding with the kind of higher profile, um, you know, like um, very scary men, um, which is why I found it appropriate to write about her because she wasn't doing it anymore. Like she, you know, had some perspective on what led her there. So again, very small sample size. I can really only speak to her experience and what she told me. And this is something she did when she was really young, like still, you know, a teenager, like 19, 20 years old. And what she told me was that, you know, she was, um, very depressed, like in active drug addiction. 
And she sought these people out because she was kind of trying to understand, you know, this, this like darkness she felt inside her, um, how someone else would experience that. So I think that that's one example that's like very much like a young person's, you know, kind of psychology on that, right? Um, but I think what's even more interesting than, than that very kind of like um, literal, you know, like women writing to men who kill women, is women's fascination with true crime. Like women are the, you know, primary audience of true crime in this country, whether it's like forensic files, me too. I mean, we, like, <laughs> you know, it, it's like a huge women consume these things. Um, you know, the oxygen channel, which is all true crime programming. Like it's like lifetime true crime for women. Um, and I think that's really interesting. So I think that what we see is this kind of distorted, like person obsessed with, you know, Scott Peterson or whatever. We see, you know, like watered down a little bit in our culture in a more acceptable kind of format. So I think that's really rich and interesting too. Mm, very, very. All right. And um, we have one more question. Can you talk about how relationships change after a person is released? And uh, do you have any statistics on how many last or are the vast majority uh, between people serving very long sentences, life, et cetera? Great question. Um, so I have my own anecdotal statistics from the couples that I followed in the book and some you know, couples I know but didn't end up writing about, <laughs> excuse me, but um, have stayed in touch with for years. And I will say um, that it is very similar to what we see on the outside, which is about half, half stay together, half break up, you know, which is very um, in line with kind of like the divorce statistics in this country. And what I notice often is that um, prison and like criminality, if you will, has very little to do with whether people stay together once they get out or they do not. People who are incarcerated um, and also who struggle with addiction, that is a deck stacked against you. Like that is really, really tough because you have to, you know, be maintaining all of the um, protocols and following all the rules of probation, which is hard enough on its own while going to these like additional drug counseling classes and testing, which you pay for out of pocket and staying sober when you're traumatized, you know, um, without the resources that should be available in terms of healthcare and mental health care. So addiction is a really big stumbling block for people um, getting out of prison, whether they're in a relationship or not. Um, and, you know, I think like that trauma piece I talked about that comes as a big surprise to people, um, you know, when you're not only learning to live together for the first time, but how to um, just cope with the modern world, which you've been excluded from. So those are some really big challenges, but people do make it. And, and it's been so great, to, you know, I have like, a, you know, a number of success stories. I love following these stories. And I will say, even with the couples I've noticed where they did break up, where, you know, either the person stayed in prison and they broke up because for whatever reason, the sentence was too long. It just wasn't worth it to them anymore. Or they come home and it's not all it's cracked up to be and they break up. People do not regret this experience. Like they don't say, oh, I wasted all those years or anything. I mean, people come out of this, you know, being very grateful for the insight and knowledge it gave them into what this relationship is, into what the carceral state is, and into, you know, friendships that they make with other prison wives, with other people going through um, the similar situation. So even if people break up, I really haven't heard uh, many regrets yet. So that was pretty interesting. Wow, this has been fascinating. I think I speak for everybody when I say I wish we had more time. Um, thank you. Same here. Both. I see that the time, your timing is 
Perfect, because here we are at the bottom of the hour. I want to thank you, Elizabeth. I want to thank you, Rafia, for joining us. It's been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you, everybody out there, um, for coming as well. As a gentle reminder, um, if you want to learn more about it, there it is. There's the book. I put the link in the chat. It'll take you directly to the Politics and Prose website. Rafia's book will also be available soon. Um, maybe I'll get lucky enough to do an event with you as well when your book comes out. Um, in the meantime, everybody, stay well and stay well read. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.